Hello everybody, this is Pastor Jonathan Goff of Maribel Friends Church. You're about to listen to the recorded worship service from March 25, 2012. As always, we've made some edits to the recording in the interests of privacy and listenability, including the removal of the open worship time and the prayer list, as well as some other minor edits. We hope you find this recording to be a blessing, and we invite you to come worship with us Sunday mornings at 10.45 with Sunday School at 9.45. friends. Welcome to Maryville Friends Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. Let us pray. Gracious God, we're so thankful for this beautiful Sunday that you've given us to come to your house and worship. Be with everyone that couldn't be here today. Put your loving arms around them and help them, whatever their concerns may be. Thank you for each and every person that's here this morning. Please be with Jonathan as he brings our message that it will be a blessing to each of us. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I want to thank Bill and we for the, for hosting Fellowship Night last night. I understand I wasn't able to be here, but I understand it was great. Oh, um, thank you. And next month, it's Ron. Ron's going to host. And it's what day, Jeanette? I've forgotten. March the 20th? April. I mean, April 20th? <laughs> okay. Twenty. <laughs> 21st, okay. So put that on your calendars. Um, Wednesday night we have Bible study and with the carry-in meal at 6.30. And then next Sunday we'll be um, ministering council. And then our monthly meeting for next month will be April the 1st. be a week early because of Easter. And then on... Good Friday, we'll have a service here at 7 p.m., so we hope, hope so everyone can come to that. Looking forward to Easter Sunday, because a lot of us will have grandchildren home. So, um, We received a, a thank you from the Gideons for um, 46 Gideon Place Bibles. So I'll put this on the bulletin board if you'd like to see it. Um, are there any other announcements? If not, I'll ask Henry to come up, and our first song is number 398, Fill My Cup, Lord. If you'll stand, please. Thirsting on my 
Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. We'll now have our time for prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray. Precious God, we lift up to you all these folks that are in need of your mercy and your care and your love. You know the needs of all these, the difficulties they're facing, the challenges that come with living in this world that is not the perfect world you desire, but is the one that we have to live with. We ask you as a great healer to place your hand upon all these that are struggling with difficulties physically, mentally, emotionally, who are struggling to have that spiritual connection with you to keep them going and strong. We ask on behalf of all those that we know and all those that we're not aware of, but that we know you care for every day. Help us to never forget that it's only by your grace, by your power, that we have the wonderful good things that we do have. And that it's thanks to you, all of these can be healed and made well once again. And not only in the difficult times that we come to you, but also in the times of joy and celebration, giving the thanks and the praise to you who so richly deserve it. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I have gifts for everybody today. You can pick whichever one you want. Come on, Susan, you want one? Come on, pick one out. Box. Okay, that'll be $20. Oh, I don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when we give somebody a gift, it's, it's something that we give them and we don't expect anything in return, money or anything, right? That's the way that's supposed to go anyways. So, anybody here would like something as a gift you might want, you know? You might ask for a pair of earrings or a diamond ring or... I know Ron's wanted things like a... The first year we were married, he wanted a router. And I went to the store and I asked him where their routers were, so... <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but we give gifts to people and we don't expect anything in return. Because it's not a gift if we expect something for it, $20 or whatever. <clears throat> well, the greatest gift that's ever been given is the gift that God gave us all. He gave us Jesus, who came here to die on the cross for us to pay for our sins. And um, he didn't expect anything in return for that. We didn't have to give him anything. We don't have to do anything for it. All we have to do is accept that gift. Now, it's not polite to ask how much a gift costs either, is it? If I gave you a gift, you wouldn't go, gee, what did you pay for that, Jeanette? 
So we don't, well, actually, if I got $20, I would have been making out real good on this one. <laughs> so we don't want to ask somebody how much a gift costs. But in this case, the gift that we received, it does tell us in the Bible how much it cost. And it cost Jesus his life, and it cost God his only son. And in the Bible it tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And all we have to do for that gift is receive it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the gift of sending your Son here to show us the way that we should live our lives and who ultimately paid the biggest price anyone can. He gave his life freely so that we might be forgiven of our sins. And we thank you for that, the greatest gift of all. Amen. Thank you, Jeanette. If you stand, please, for our next hymn. It's number 295, Revive Us Again. And we'll be singing verses 1, 2, and 4. If you'll stand, please. Good morning, friends. Good morning. I have a confession to make. Well, not really a confession, more of an explanation. A change in plans, if you will. Um, I was working on the message for the week, praying about it, studying the scriptures, looking for the right words, and I just wasn't really feeling led to give this particular message anymore this particular week. I don't know if it was the sunshine or the fact that yesterday was St. Patrick's Day and I was feeling drawn to a different theme and a different message. Whatever the reason, I'm afraid I've made a liar out of the bulletin. Sorry. Um, keep that scripture passage in mind, though, because we are going to come back to it. Instead, I'd like to open up by reading out of the letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verses 23 through 29, if you'd like to follow along. Galatians 3, 23. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Let us pray.
God, we thank you for this precious opportunity that we have to gather together and worship as a fellowship of believers. We ask you to take this scripture, use it to inspire a message, and that any, any messages shared this morning will come from your spirit and be directed to your purposes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was a kid, growing up as I did in an area with a lot of Scotch-Irish folks, as many of us have done, I always needed to make sure I had at least one article of green clothing. Now normally that was a green shirt, that was best for me because I didn't do green socks, it seemed out of the ordinary, didn't do green pants, wasn't that confident, and I think green shoes is just a bit silly. You might disagree, but that's the way I felt. Now, I say I always needed to have green clothes, and it wasn't because every day I was supposed to wear them, but it was really just the one day that mattered, wasn't it? That one day, of course, was St. Patrick's Day. After all, I didn't want to get pinched. I don't think anybody did when they were a kid. And if you don't wear St. Patrick, or don't wear green on St. Patrick's Day, then you're fair game to get pinched, or at least that's how it was when I was little. Fortunately, as I got older, it's not such a big deal anymore, and I can go around and not wear my green on St. Patrick's Day. Now, it didn't matter if you knew anything about St. Patrick, about what he did for the Irish. It didn't matter if you were Irish at all. As long as you wore your green, and you ate your corned beef and cabbage, and you had a shamrock, or you talked about leprechauns, then that's all that really was important. It was like Halloween, or is like Halloween, except that everybody's supposed to wear the same costume, or at least a variation on the same costume. Even if you're not Catholic and you don't celebrate Saints Days as a, you know, as a matter of course, this is one particular saint that everybody seems to enjoy celebrating. Even if you're not Irish by heritage, although around here you're not going to find many people that don't have some sort of Irish heritage in them, something about the Irish and and settling and having lots of kids. But there's just something about St. Patty's Day, at least especially in this country. I'm not sure if I heard this growing up or if I just picked it up from a movie that was really popular when I was in college, but is really inappropriate for church. But there's a line that goes, on St. Patrick's Day, everybody's Irish. Doesn't matter where you come from or who, or who, you, who you are, 364 days of the year, that 365th day, that one day of the year, everybody's Irish. Doesn't matter if you're English or if you're German. Doesn't matter if you're black or Hispanic, Native American. You might even actually be Irish off the boat, actually from Ireland. And we won't even bother trying to distinguish on St. Patrick's Day Irish from Scottish. For this particular day, yesterday, everybody's Irish. There's something about it in, in American culture. And it's a fun day. Everybody wears the green. Everybody talks about leprechauns. Consumes certain beverages that aren't fit to be discussed in church. At least not a teetotaling church anyway. Some, some they'd be fine talking about those or maybe even having those. Not everybody does that, obviously. But that's pretty much a stereotype. Right? It's a kind of an excuse for that sort of behavior. There's been a St. Patrick's Day parade and celebration in Boston every year since 1737. That's 275 years as of yesterday. That's a long time to have a celebration, at least, at least in the United States. Now, if you were over in Europe, that would be like last Friday. But in our country, at least, that's a pretty long time. That's 40 years longer than there's been an independent America in any form or fashion. Or if you don't want to go all the way up to Boston and be part of that old tradition, you can go down to Savannah, biggest St. Patty's party in the South, or so I've heard. Or you can go to Chicago and you can see them turn the river bright green. And I mean on purpose, not from the pollution. This is the one day when they intend to turn the river bright green. So everybody has their fun to whatever extent they want to have fun. You see your shamrocks, you see the color green, even the professional sports teams. I was watching, because I do this, I watch ESPN. I was watching highlights of various games, and I was like, wow, even the New York Knicks, 
not a green colored team, by the way. Even the New York Knicks were in the color green because it's St. Patrick's Day. And everybody does that. And it's a fun day. But then the next day, or whenever the celebration is over for those that take a little bit longer with their celebrating, everything goes back to the way it used to be. You've had your corned beef and your cabbage. You've worn your green. You've done whatever it is that you're not supposed to do, or you are supposed to do. But your life goes on as normal, and it's become just a fun little holiday. Not something that really has a permanent life-changing effect for you. Most people, anyway. But what if it wasn't a temporary thing? Not the partying and carousing. But what if everybody suddenly did actually become Irish and stayed that way? Now you might be thinking, so we'd all either be East Tennesseans or Kennedys. Take your pick. Some of you might pick some, something different than some others. But, but that's not what I mean. I'm thinking of a case where you wouldn't actually lose your identity as whatever your heritage is. But it would suddenly become secondary to what made you like your neighbor. What made or makes all of us Irish, in my analogy. Now, it sounds kind of silly to talk about it that way. After all, we can't change our heritage. We can't change what our ancestors were. Maybe that's a little bit culturally insensitive. But as an analogy, this is exactly the sort of thing that here in this passage in Galatians, Paul is telling us we're meant to do. Not become Irish, of course, because they would have been as foreign and unknown to him as any barbarian tribe would have been back then, up in their little island, not part of the empire. But this idea of, of taking on a new identity as a permanent state of being, having it change your whole worldview, your whole outlook, something that binds you together with other people, gives you something in common. Not just a, a one-day-of-the-year event, but an actual identity-changing experience. It's just a fun holiday to be part of everybody's Irish and Aaron Gobra and whatever else you say on St. Patrick's Day. Just a fun holiday for that. But being a Christian and becoming a Christian is so much more. It's to have a longer-lasting, a more permanent effect on our lives. So in this way, I think, and I like to say, that the Irish almost have it right on St. Patrick's Day. Now here in this scripture passage, here in Galatians, Paul the Apostle, he's writing, this is part of a larger letter, part of his letter to the churches in a, in a part of the empire called Galatia. And he's trying to make some corrections, trying to explain some things, tell them where some of the things they've been hearing aren't quite right since he's been there. and It's been a while since he's been back. See, the Galatians were converted by Paul and baptized into the Christian church, or what became the Christian church, the believers of Christ. But they've started to have some difficulties, and this is why Paul has to write them a letter. Giving them advice and counsel. Sometimes if you read the rest of it, you'll see he sometimes gets angry and frustrated with them for just not quite getting what he's trying to say. He had a bit of a temper tantrum, Paul did. Um, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. He toned it down. He wasn't going around killing people anymore, but he still had a bit of a temper. So here in chapter 3, Paul is trying to explain, and goes on into chapter 4, how the old separations, the old divisions that would divide Jews and Greeks, the cultural separations and barriers, the old law and the old way of doing things, don't matter now as part of the community of Christ. Because what had happened was some missionaries had come down from Jerusalem, or come up if you want to think north and south. They'd, they'd come from Jerusalem to these new Christians, to these churches, and they've been telling the Galatian men that they need to be circumcised. It's extremely important, they're saying, if you're going to be Christian, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, that you be circumcised and follow the laws of Moses. And in fact, they were saying, this is the law that Paul himself keeps. And I'm sure they mentioned that when they were trying to convince the Galatians that sticking to Jewish law was something they had to do. I mean, after all, if Paul did it, 
And Paul was the one that converted them. They were probably thinking, well, maybe these guys are right. Not something Paul really talked about, but if it's something he practices and sticks to and keeps. And these guys from Jerusalem are telling us it's really important to stick to these things and to keep them. Then maybe we ought to listen. But here you can see that Paul is saying, no, in fact, that's not needed. Not for all Christians, not for all believers and followers of Jesus. Something that Paul felt was really important for his own spiritual life to maintain those practices, to maintain that Jewish identity that he'd had since he was a young man and came to know God. But for these Gentile followers, for these Galatian believers, that's not needed anymore. That's not something that's any longer important to have that relationship with God. It's the spirit, he's saying. It's the faith in Christ that matters now, not strict adherence to the law. The law was just a step in the process for the nation of Israel. But for those that come into a relationship with Christ now, he's saying, it doesn't really apply. You're not Israelites. You're not Jews. You're followers of Christ. And that's what that's what's important. There's two important points I'd like us to take away from this passage today. And the first is this, which Paul makes explicit. Those old distinctions don't matter now. Because God gave you a new identity, a new heritage, if you will, that everybody can share, whatever their original background was. Like on St. Patrick's Day, when everybody's Irish for at least one day, after becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter if you're actually Irish or if you're German or English or black or Hispanic or Native American. After becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, everybody's a Christian. That's what the important thing is anymore. That's what matters now. Jew and Greek, the huge divider back then, what separated the Gentiles from the followers of the Old Testament, the followers of the covenant, doesn't matter anymore, Paul's saying. In Christ, this separation is abolished, this division between clean and unclean people, because Jews and Gentiles are now bound together, constituted together, you might say, as one people of God. In Christ, it doesn't matter, he's saying here, what your social position is, slave or free. It doesn't matter if you're a garbage disposal worker or president of the United States. That distinction, no longer important. Doesn't matter in God's eyes. All of us Christians, that's what God sees. Anybody that accepts that and has that relationship with Christ. Doesn't matter, Paul is saying, and still applies today, man or woman, boy or girl. Those old divisions, abolished in God's eyes. I've heard some powerful messages, and I'm sure you have too, brought by women, some gifted and wonderful leadership right here in this church. Whatever our, whatever our gender, all Christian in God's eyes. Do you see how important this message is still today? How, in some circles, how radical a message that still is. This leveling, this social, no longer these distinctions between class, between gender, between history and background. Try go talking to some wealthy, upscale actor. Go and tell Tom Cruise, God values me just as much as you do. Hopefully there's not a couch nearby for him to jump on, but, but go talk to Tom Cruise like that. Tell him. Tell his agent. Doesn't matter. God loves me just as much. Also, I'm about a foot taller. <laughs> but we're all humans. And it's, and it's a lot harder for us. And I think that's an important point to remember. It's a lot harder for us than it is for God to, lo to, lo no, yeah, to no longer see those distinctions. We don't have God's perspective. On the one hand, that's unfortunate because we can't see the true equality of people. On the other hand, I'm, I, I'm glad because I don't want to see everything everywhere and all the terrible things that are happening. 
But we need to be reminded, God's made us all Irish. I mean Christian. Just <laughs> God's made some of us all Irish. Just like everybody's Christian, no matter what other distinctives we might have. Those aren't done away with. I don't stop being a guy just because I'm a Christian. But they're rendered secondary to this equality in Jesus Christ. The important thing is not that I'm from Jefferson County. The important thing is that I'm a Christian. It was the ability of Quakers to see this, to see this equality of all people in our Creator's eyes, that led a lot of them to oppose slavery in ways great and small. And we can look back on that history and that tradition and say, yeah, how wonderful. But we always need to ask ourselves in the present just as well, do we recognize in our day-to-day -day lives that all are equal, that God makes no distinctions, but all are Christian, all are children of God that have accepted a relationship with him. And not only that, doesn't recognize those, but abolishes the ones we as humans create and that we like to maintain. Another thing about this, this equality, this new identity, why it's good, I think, to bring this up during a Lenten season, preparing for Easter, cleansing our hearts like we've been talking about, and the reason why this fits this week. Because in the sight of God, it doesn't matter what we've done before. It doesn't matter what sins we've committed, how big or how small, how terrible or how petty in our lives before accepting Christ. God wants all of us, wherever we come from, small, great, whatever sins, he wants to wash those away. With thanks to Mel Brooks, it doesn't matter if we're prone to temper tantrums, if we're rustlers, drunkards, bounty hunters, desperados, mugs, pugs, thugs, nitwits, halfwits, dimwits, vipers, snipers, con men, card sharks, bandits, muggers, bushwhackers, hornswogglers, horse thieves, train robbers, bank robbers, or Methodists. No matter where we come from, what our background, what we've done before, all those are done away, washed away in God's eyes. Washed away in the blood of the Lamb, as the songs say. Because now... Now we're different. Now we're new. We're created new. We're created Irish. A Christian, I should say. And that's a hard thing for us to keep in mind. It's a hard thing as humans to see and to recognize. Because, more, because what's more human nature? What's more natural, you might say, from the human perspective, than to hold somebody's past against them and to say, well, you've done this before, so I can expect you to do the same thing again. And I'm not saying that we don't need to be careful and that we don't need to remember and that we don't need to look out. But from God's perspective, once they've accepted that forgiveness, once they've been washed clean in the blood of Christ, those old distinctions no longer matter. Now the second thing that we can take away from this passage here in Galatians is just as important. And it might be even more difficult than remembering that in God's eyes all sins are washed away and we're all fresh and we're all clean upon repentance. Because St. Patrick's Day is a temporary thing. It's a one day or a two-day or a three-day, depending on how much you party. But it's a one-day. Everybody has their fun, and then things return to normal. You go back to the way life was before. But guess what? Jesus doesn't work that way. The Christian life doesn't work that way. When you accept that relationship, when you start on that relationship with Christ, when you take on that new life, you don't just stop. 
You don't say, I'm going to do this for a day, and I'm going to put it aside and go back to the way things were before. You can't just put it on for a little bit and then pretend you're done with it. Not when the Spirit's really got a hold on you, when you're really committed to starting that new life. And we're all guilty of that to some degree, aren't we? I know I've been guilty of it, thinking, well, I can be Christian on Sunday, and then I can go back to my 11th grade English class and think they're all a bunch of idiots. Something that our society encourages. To partition our time. To be Christian at the right time, as the world would see it, and then to go back to the way we were, bef way, way we were before. But this isn't just a game. This isn't just fun. This isn't like St. Patrick's Day where the only repercussions for most people is waking up the next morning and remembering what they'd done. Unlike that temporary outcome, that possible negative temporary outcome, when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, when we're baptized in the fire of God and we have that new life in Christ, we are changed and transformed. We're made no longer Tennessean, Pennsylvanian, Ohioan. Made no longer Jew nor Greek, male nor female. Actor or garbage scow worker. And we cannot as the Galatians, as the, the folks were trying to convince the Galatians to do, simply live in the law because it's not going to save us. Instead, we have to live by the Spirit and let the Spirit guide our life in a way that's pleasing to God. So as we go now into our time of open worship and we prepare ourselves to to go back out there. I invite you to consider St. Patrick and consider how we are Irish for just a day, except for those of us that aren't for just a day, but we are Christian for a lifetime. Are we remembering in our day-to-day -day lives and in our encounters with other people that in Christ there is no Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, and our remembering in our encounters with other people and in our own looking at our own lives that our sins have been washed, made clean, and that new identity is fresh as children of God, as people that have accepted our identity as children of God. So think of this as an opportunity to allow yourself to be transformed and to help transform those around you. And after some time of open worship, I'll bring that to a close with prayer. Or, yeah. And all God's people said, Amen. I'd like to ask if Henry will come back up now, and we'll have our closing hymn, number 306, Jesus Saves, verses 1, 3, and 4, if you'll stand.
wedding's all around Jesus saves, Jesus saves Bear the news to every land Climb the steps and cross the waves Onward is the Lord who <coughs> Jesus saves Hang above the battle strife Jesus saves, Jesus saves By the path and in the slime Jesus saves, Jesus saves Sing it softly through the gloom When the heart for mercy came Sing the triumph over time Jesus saves, Jesus saves Let the nations now rejoice Jesus saves, Jesus saves Now salvation full and free Highest hills and deepest caves This is a song of victory Jesus saves, Jesus saves I invite you to greet one another in Christian fellowship. And nothing this afternoon. Have a wonderful Sunday. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we've had to gather together and lift our voices and open our hearts to your spirit. We ask that as we leave the worship and continue the service that you will direct our steps, our thoughts, our actions, that all that we do will be in service to you. We ask you to be with those who could not be here for whatever reason and be with those of us that were able to be here, that we may safely return once again to praise and worship you. All this in Jesus' name. Amen.